is the 2020 BMW M8 competition, and it is the ultimate BMW M car. I say this not because it has 617 horsepower and 553 pound-feet of torque, which are huge numbers, but because this one costs almost $160,000, which makes this the most expensive BMW M car on sale today. And today, I'm going to show you what that money buys you. I've borrowed this M8 competition from Crevier BMW, which is here in Orange County in Southern California. Crevier sells more BMWs than any other BMW dealership in North America, and they just got the M8 competition, which has just started to go on sale. So what exactly is the M8 competition? Well, about a year ago, I reviewed the new BMW 8 Series, which is BMW's new big coupe or convertible that replaces the 6 Series in BMW's growing lineup. The base level 8 Series is called the M850i, and it uses a 520 horsepower turbocharged V8 and it does 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds. It's a pretty special car. But this is a step above that. Actually, this is two steps above. There's a standard M8 with 590 horsepower, and then there's this, the M8 competition with an amazing 617 horsepower and 553 pound-feet of torque. It'll do 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds, and yes, the sticker on this car is just below $160,000, which makes it about $40,000 more expensive than a well-equipped BMW M5 competition. So, is it worth it? Today, I'm going to try to find out. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the M8 competition, and I'm going to show you all the interesting quirks and features of the ultimate BMW M car. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features of the M8 competition with a few interesting lighting related items. And I'm going to start with the seats. Now, usually seats don't have any lighting, but in this car, they do. You open the door and an M8 logo on the seats lights up, which I think is a cool little touch. It's a very small thing, but it's a nice piece of attention to detail reminding you that you have a special car. And next up, speaking of lighting and opening the doors, if you look around this interior, you will see this nice blue ambient light everywhere that gives a certain mood inside this car. But when you open up the doors, you can see the blue lighting on the door panel goes from blue to flashing red. The theory here is that the flashing red is supposed to alert oncoming traffic, pedestrians, or cyclists that your door is open so they don't accidentally run into you. So this red flashing light is a safety feature. But then when you close the door again, it stops flashing and it goes back to whatever ambient lighting color you have the interior set for. And next up, we move on to another cool lighting feature in this car, and that would be the speakers. This car has a very high-end, expensive Bowers and Wilkins sound system, and you can see the speakers are backlit with this very interesting glow. I love how this looks, especially the upper one with this, like, cyclone pattern. It's a very, very cool look. Now, one interesting thing is that when you turn off the stereo in this car, those lights go away. They dim and they turn off, going dark until they're needed again when you turn the stereo back on. And next up, another interesting lighting-related item comes on the spokes of the steering wheel. There are little lights here. They're not on right now, so they're not doing anything, but they light up to communicate various items to the driver. You can see when I'm driving, they will light up, and they'll show you, for example, that the automated steering system has met its conditions and it's ready to turn on, or that it's time for you to take over, or various other things. So you have these flashing lights in the steering wheel that can alert you if necessary. And next up, we move on to some of this car's interesting and notable performance details since this is the M8 competition after all. Now the first item worth noting is a button in the center console marked M mode. If you press that, it will switch the car from normal street mode to sport mode. Nothing particularly interesting about that, 
but there are several rather unusual items related to this car's sport modes. For example, you can configure your own sport mode. So instead of just putting it in sport mode and letting the computer do it for you, you can configure how you want the engine, the suspension, the chassis to feel. Now, there are two different configurable settings, M1 and M2, and the cool thing is how you activate them these little red buttons on the steering wheel. So for example, if you have one setting for canyon roads and you get on a canyon road, you don't have to go and find it in the infotainment screen. You just press this little steering wheel thumb button and boom, you're in your M1 canyon setting. If you have a different setting for the racetrack and you get on the track, just press your little thumb button for M2 and it automatically goes into it. It's a really cool idea. Now, next up, another interesting M mode item with this car. Like I mentioned, you can use that M mode button in the middle to switch between normal and sport, but there's also a third setting called track. Now, if you hold down the M mode button for like three seconds, the car will ask you if you are sure you want to go into track mode. So then you press to confirm and the center screen goes dark. That's because when you're in track mode, the car figures you only want to focus on your racetrack driving. So the gauge cluster stays on and shows you what you need to know, but all of the rest of the infotainment stuff that you don't need, like your navigation system or your radio, that's gone unless you press the screen or a center console button to turn it back on manually. And next up, another interesting item with M mode. If you want to adjust your performance settings, you can configure your chassis settings, your suspension, your steering. Most cars allow you to mess with that stuff, but this car also lets you configure your brakes. This is something I've never seen before. If you go into the configuring on M mode, you can choose the brakes between normal and sport, and this adjusts like their bite point, how grabby they are, essentially how sporty they are. Of course, you'll want them in sport on the track. Usually, there's not configurable brakes, but this car has it. But probably the most impressive configurable item in this car is the drivetrain. All right, check this out. In normal mode, the M8 competition is an all-wheel drive car, which makes sense because it's really powerful, and so you want four wheels to get that power to the ground. But if you press this little button in the center console to turn off stability control and you hold it down, you can then configure whether you want to be an all-wheel drive or rear wheel drive. So this car allows you to electronically select if you wanna be in all or rear wheel drive. It's amazing. Of course, in some track setups, you may prefer rear wheel drive. It might be better around a racetrack or on certain curvy roads, so you can do that. There's also an all wheel drive sport setting, as you can see, that kind of splits the difference between the two, but by far the most interesting thing here is the ability to choose with the literal push of a button whether you wanna be all wheel drive or rear wheel drive. And next up, another cool thing that happens when you put this car in sport mode is that the gauge cluster changes. This doesn't happen on a lot of newer BMW models, but it does happen here. You can see it switches from kind of a normal gauge cluster to a sportier one, which looks cool. And the sportier one has the tachometer on like both sides, which looks really cool when you're revving it. I love the look of the sporty gauge cluster in this car. Although it's also worth noting that I like the look of the tachometer in the regular gauge cluster too. You can see it kind of revs in this like 3D trapezoid shape. And I think it's a neat look. Both of them are cool, but I like the fact that it adjusts when you go into sport mode. But this car isn't all about performance. Being a modern BMW and an expensive one, it's also packed with luxury and technology. And there are quite a few quirks and features in that arena. I'm gonna start with gesture control. Let's pretend you want more stereo volume. You could do the boring thing and just turn the volume knob, or you could do this with your finger, and as you can see, the volume is going up. I'm not touching anything, but the car is sensing my finger's presence and this motion I'm making, and that will turn the volume up or down. There are many different types of gesture controls. Here's another one. If you gesture with your thumb in a certain direction, it will change the radio station that you're listening to. This also applies to the stereo track that you have on. If you wanna move on to the next track, instead of just pressing the boring next track button, gesture with your thumb like this and it will change tracks, which is a pretty impressive idea, gesture control. And the luxury and technology in this car continues was something called Caring Car. And Caring Car has two different modes, Vitalize 
and relax. If you select Vitalize, it says that this feature will activate the driver with a blend of ambient lighting, climate control, and music. It will actually adjust all those things, including the music, to a vitalizing ecosystem in here to make you feel vitalized. Amazingly, if you go into Caring Car and select Relax, it says that the Relax system de-stresses the driver with a combination of ambient lighting, climate control, and music. And if you turn that on, it will play de-stressing music to again kind of emphasize your relaxing experience. Take a listen. To me, the most amazing thing about Caring Car is that it just kind of does it for you. So if you feel like you want to relax, you don't have to set the seat ventilation, the climate control, the ambient lighting, the music. You just press relax and the car takes care of it. That's what you get when you spend $160,000. More amazing though is what happens to the climate control if I go into Vitalize. I thought it would just blow cold air at you, but check this out. Vitalize mode is on and you can see it's actually increasing and decreasing the fan speed constantly. So it's blowing like a puff of air at you and then going back down. Then it raises the fan speed, air puffs at you, and then it goes back down again. It's trying to vitalize you by basically blowing spurts of air on you and the car is automatically increasing and decreasing the amount of air to get those spurts to come out instead of one steady stream. Very unusual. And next up, another impressive technology feature in this car is that it has something called side collision warning with steering intervention. To explain that in more reasonable terms, a lot of cars will automatically brake if they sense you're about to hit something in the front. This car will automatically steer if it senses you're about to get hit on the side, which is insane. That is impressive modern technology. And speaking of impressive modern technology, this car also features an automated driving system, which is pretty advanced for today's cars. You can see there's a little camera inside the gauge cluster area. That camera monitors your eyes to make sure that you're looking forward. As long as you're looking forward and going under 40 miles an hour, the car will basically drive itself. BMW calls this traffic jam assistant, and it's basically intended to allow the car to take over if you're in bump bumper to bumper traffic. If you don't want to steer, work the gas, then the brake, then the gas, then the brake, the car will do it all for you. And that little camera monitors your eyes to make sure you're paying attention to the road. As long as you are, it will keep driving for you at speeds under 40 miles an hour. Now, when you go above 40 miles an hour, this car just has a typical adaptive cruise control system with steering assist. It's not quite as comprehensive as below 40. And next up, another excellent technology feature in this car is that it has something called the drive recorder. Go into BMW apps, you can select the drive recorder, and this is a dash cam, basically. You could manually turn it on or have it automatically turn on, and it will record you driving. That way, if you get into an accident, you can go into your footage and prove, hey, I wasn't at fault, this person hit me, whatever. That's built in in this car. Tesla also has this, but many other automakers have been very slow to adapt to adding dash cams. I think all cars should have this feature, and I'm happy to see other brands are starting to add it as well. And next up, also under BMW apps, you have something called climate control rules. This is not merely a statement. Climate control rules. <laughs> Instead, it's rules that you can use for the climate control. You go in there and you can configure that anytime the temperature is under a certain degree, the car's heated seats will automatically turn on. Same deal anytime the temperature is over a certain degree, the cooled seats will automatically turn on. That way, you don't have to merely press buttons. You get in the car on a cold day, your heated seats will automatically already be heating. And finally, our last interesting BMW app is the Personal Assistant, which is basically just voice control. It's like Siri if you're an Apple user. You can talk to it and it will do things for you. The thing I find most interesting in here, though, is you can configure relationships. So if you upload your contact list to the car, you can tell it who's your brother, your mother, your father. And that way, if you want to call your father, you can just tell your assistant, call father, and you don't have to actually say the person's name. The interesting thing to me, though, is 
you can delete these relationships. So if you decide that your father is no longer your father, you can just go into that screen and remove him, and then your relationship is gone, at least as far as your car is concerned. And next we move on to the back seat of the M8 competition. Getting back here is pretty simple. You just pull on a little latch on the side of the seat, push the seat back forward, and then it automatically whirs forward so you can climb into the back. Now, once it is all the way forward, you just kind of twist yourself back here. Not a whole lot of room and you're in the back seat. Once you get in the back seat, you discover three things. One, it is not very large back here, especially when you put the front seat back and then it starts to crowd me and ah! Okay, I guess it sensed that I was here and it spared me, but there's really not all that much room back here. The back seats in this car, kind of like a 911, a little bigger than that, but they're more for children or for short trips. The next thing you notice back here is there's nothing really interesting or exciting, nothing really special back here. BMW knows these back seats aren't gonna be used all that often, so they don't cram it full of tech and cool features. And next up, we move on to the back of the M8 competition, specifically the trunk. You pop open the trunk and you discover well, nothing particularly interesting. There's nothing weird or special back here, although I will say the trunk is unusually deep. Even though the opening is not really all that large, it goes really far back here, presumably so you could easily fit a set of golf clubs, the usual trunk standard. But because of that, it's quite deep back here in the back of your M8. And next up, we move around to the front of the M8 and into the engine compartment. And you can see the engine. You have a twin turbo V8 in here. I've shown you around a lot of modern BMW engine compartments. So there's nothing new or particularly interesting to see, but it is worth noting this is a very powerful engine, 617 horsepower. It's the same engine that's in the new BMW M5 competition, and it really makes this into the ultimate BMW M car. And next up, we move on to some other interesting exterior items with the M8 competition, starting with these wheels. It's a very distinctive wheel design. It is unique to the competition version of the M8. The regular M8 has different wheels, so this is one way you can tell apart the competition. Same deal on the back. You can see on the trunk, it doesn't just say M8. It says M8 competition to let those who know really know. One other exterior item worth noting, you also have a cool carbon fiber roof. Now, this is a very luxurious technology-infused car. I'm not sure if it's really worth saving probably like six pounds for a carbon fiber roof, but it certainly looks cool up there. The other interesting item on the outside of this car is the window sticker. And if you look at it, you can see that the base price for the M8 competition is $146,000. This car has about $10,000 worth of options on it, including that Bowers and Wilkins sound system I mentioned earlier. You also have a $1,000 destination charge and a $1,000 gas guzzler tax, bringing the total price to just under $160,000 thousand dollars, which is big money. And so those are the quirks and features of the BMW M8 competition. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the M8 competition. <laughs> wow, the car is surprisingly sporty. I enjoyed driving the M850i. I thought it was great, but um, you, you could tell that it was it was a luxury car that had some like sporty pretensions. It was sportier than I expected it to be, but this, this just fast. <laughs> Think of zero to 60 in three, two, that's 620 horsepower basically. Unbelievable. And this sound is fantastic. Now don't let that dissuade you if you're looking for kind of a luxury car. I think one of the benefits of this car is it's the luxury antidote for people who are are thinking about an AMG GT and they want something a little bit less crazy, a little bit less restrictive and, and bouncy. And that's kind of this. And yet this isn't quite on the level of the S63 Coupe, which I think is too luxurious. This is sort of in that in-between state. Now, how many buyers live in that in-between state? Probably not that many. But if that's you, this is kind of the perfect car. To me, I think probably the biggest competitor of this car will be the 911. And this is a rare instance in which BMW is cheaper than the competition. I just did a review of a 99, the new 992. Great car, but $150,000 sticker for a pretty sparsely medium equipped Carrera S. 
um, which was about as quick as this. Obviously, this doesn't handle like a 992, but in terms of technology and equipment, it's on a totally different level than the one that I drove, and it's only about 8,000 more expensive. And it has a much better sound. Mm. <laughs> Man, this thing really, really comes alive. I'm really surprised by it, because it's a big car. Uh, and you know, you see the numbers, 600 plus horsepower, zero to 60 and three, two. This thing really translates that to the road. You really feel like you're that quick. It is interesting to me that BMW is nonetheless trying to kind of compete in that world. Um, this is a segment that BMW has not been tremendously successful in. The original six series was canceled. The original eight series was canceled. The newest six series was canceled. Now they're trying again. Um, but BMW kind of wants to have a fire in every pot. And this is a great car in this segment if you're interested in a car in this segment. Surprisingly precise, stable, steering is shockingly quick for a car this big. It's a really, really great big coupe, probably the best big coupe. It's just that there's not that much of a market anymore for a big coupe. Uh, but if you're into one, BMW's done a tremendous job of neutralizing this car's size. It feels more nimble than it is when you're accelerating. It, it feels lighter on its feet than it obviously is given its weight. It's a tremendous car. They've done a great job with it, as you'd expect for $160,000. And so that's the BMW M8 competition. This is an amazing car. Impressive to drive, seriously fast, and quite luxurious. It has a small demographic. People who want a fast but very luxurious big BMW for $150,000 plus, but it's still an excellent car. And now it's time to give the M8 competition a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the M8 competition is a nice looking car, even though everyone seems to think it looks like a Mustang and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds and it gets a 9 out of 10. Handling is sharp, they're not quite on the level of the 911 and it gets a 7 out of 10. Fun factor is good, the car is fast and enjoyable, but it's just a bit too luxury car to get a really excellent score here and it earns a 6 out of 10. Cool factor is decent, the new 8 series has been pretty rare, so these are still turning heads and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 35 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. This car is loaded with a lot of great tech, not quite everything, but a lot, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Comfort is good, especially for a car like this, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is excellent, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is normal for a car in this segment, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Finally, value, and these are really expensive, and they're poised to depreciate heavily. This is a desirable car, but for a very small niche of wealthy buyers, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total daily score of 31 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 66 out of 100, which places it here against other pricey luxury coupes. The M8 competition actually ties the M850i, and the two cars only differ in acceleration and value. The competition handles better, sure, but not better enough for a higher score, and their acceleration is surprisingly similar. Both cars lose to the Porsche 911, though it's worth noting that the M8 is an especially good all-around car, as it beats out basically everything on this list in the daily categories, but it's still manages a very respectable weekend score.